Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, if you are not able to hear me or if um, I'm too fast or any of that, yeah, please make sure that you throw something in the chat. Um, we're going to, I'm going to do just a few minutes worth of a, a quick overview of um, the parts of all of this in the PLA system that um, I focus that I think are most effective or affecting on advising. Um, and then really what I'm, what I'm after today is that we have some dialogue, um, some back and forth. Certainly we, we will not necessarily be able to get to all questions and not everyone gets a chance to talk, but um, this worked well the last one we just did where you have an opportunity to ask your questions. And I'll show you how we're going to do that after I do my little piece here. So um, this particular focus group is really for people who are working directly with the students. Um, in my experience, the people who probably get the most requests and have to have the, mo the broadest range of kind of generalist information about this. Um, you know, faculty have a certain amount of information they need to have and registrars have a certain amount of information. But my tells me that you all are the ones who take the, the largest brunt of this in terms of a service to students. So I want to make sure that we have some conversation about what you can expect for new changes in the system. So just briefly, around the policy, uh, and also if you were not able to join on the introductory webinar on Monday or Tuesday, I um, want to let you know that you will be getting a copy of that recording. Um, we're, my intention is to get out a, a pretty hefty email to all of you. Anyone who is registered for any of these webinars will get an email at the end of the day on Monday as an attachment to links for all of their recordings and then also um, uh, different types of information that I'm mentioning as we're going along as well as the um, draft of the manual that I'm asking everyone to take a look at. So um, just, just a brief overview then of some of the things that we talked about. But in the policy, um, one of the things that I think are most affecting on advising, the policy requires us now to make sure that the students have all of the information that they need around PLA and the access, in accessing prior learning assessment credit opportunities, is that it's clear, concise, and published. It's the very first thing that's in the policy. And we've uh, expanded on that somewhat in the procedures document, which is not yet um, deliverable to you because it's going through the, the um, approved stages, but actually in that area, Area we talk about marketing and we talk about um, how we make these things available to students. Um, you're no longer required to earn one credit in residency prior to transcripting PLA credit, which makes a difference in terms of your recruiting practices. We know from a lot of the information that we've gathered nationally that that's actually a best practice. Students who would be uh, borderline or reluctant to come in or who might have um, some self-efficacy issues around not seeing themselves as college students in our be um, motivated and very incentivized to come in if they find out that what they already know has already earned them credit without them having to do anything to then enrolling, which is the next thing. They have to be admitted to the institution. They have to fill out your admissions form, and they do have to declare a program of study. They're not in any way held to that exactly the same as they would be in any other way, but they, they should know the ramifications of making that decision, transcripting credit, and then if they change their mind, how that might affect their um, credit. Um, the credit must apply to a declared program of study. And the dashboard tool is something that we've, uh, we're in development on. It's going to be a, a released into soft, uh, soft release in of December. We're going to ask you to use it um, locally to push it out to students as you choose. And then um, we're going to be putting it on the front page of all of your websites beginning in January. We've been working with your college communications folks big thing about that is that we didn't want any of those things to happen until you were ready to be able to um, deal who will come in via that marketing push. Um, so anyways, what this is, um, you, know, you know, that we are creating this more as a recruitment um, opportunity for it ever has been before. The procedures, um, a big part of what you'll be getting for yourself is the use of the dashboard. Um, the student, it's student facing, so the, the dashboard is going to be an interactive, it's essentially a website, and it's a, an interactive tool that sits on top of the, new, the test matrix and all of the other matrices that we're using for credit crosswalks so that students can start to gather their information before they come to see you. Um, we want them to be able to gather their credentials and the PLA information prior to advising. One of the big things that, that as a team and as a committee that we looked at early on last year when we were looking at revising policy 
was there a huge amount of inefficiencies and duplications across the colleges. Um, many, many, many things that you do, uh, colleges do, and you all locally duplicate. I know that that's not all that unusual and that we like to have local control, but at the same time, it's created this atmosphere around PLA that it is, um, it's time consuming, it's cost, it's costly, it's, um, you know, nobody's designated to do it. it it's, um, you know, while most people agree that it's a good activity for students, most also feel that it's just not something they have the time to do. And what we're looking at um, in order to meet the requirements in this new policy um, is to say, you know, okay, so how do we look at um, those locations and those inefficiencies and how we create some standards that help us tighten that up? And one of the big things that we came up with was this idea of the dashboard. The dashboard effectively gives you all the PLA information you would get in a half an hour, probably at least, of um, interviewing a student. Where work? When did it work? Um, do they have credentials of any kind? Did they take standardized testing? Do they have any other kind of um, trans that would apply for this? Entry information into the dashboard is a pretty intuitive, pretty easy thing to do the way that we're setting it up. And then what we've done is we've laid that on top of the credit matrix so that if they do something like they say, well, I got a 50 in a club English test, click their buttons and get themselves to the end of the report process, which is what's produced at the end of the, of the use of the dashboard, then what it is is you may be eligible for three credits in English 121. And what we is that some of those are you definitely will, but we're not telling them for sure you will. We're saying you may be. And the work that's created, they bring to you to or to whomever they're advising with, and I ask you all to, to get some information to me about who should be, be a primary contact in your departments or should it be a department email, that kind of thing. But, but the opportunity to send their report to that email, they have the opportunity to print it if they want to and bring it with them. And then they have the opportunity when they're with you to open it back up again and show it to you if that's what they want to do. And then we also have um, uh, the opportunity for you to be able to go into the dashboard from a different direction and to get the same information for yourself if you're sitting and advising a student. I'll talk about that in a minute. So then we also have a new standardized test matrix that increase the number of um, standard tests that we crosswalk to credit, um, 70 tests. In the last um, three months, we, we've been in place. The vice president's agreed to allow that to happen. So matter expert approval of credit crosswalks is something that's required now where it wasn't required before, although it was generally the case that um, advisors and um, um, RT, uh, transfer um, coordinators and registrars would, would work with faculty. But what we what we did is that it was not a, um, it was not a, a, a expected practice, and we needed to be in order to make sure that we're building rigor in the support for these practices that help us to be very transparent and outwardly facing. We're proud of the way that we do this. We, we want this to be some credit. Update ELA credit matrix will be ongoing. We have a content management system for the dashboard that's going to allow us to enter information at any time, and it's very easy to use. And so we're asking that when these credit crosswalks are being made that they're documented at the institution so that we can get them into the matrix and let them be shared across colleges so that we don't have to duplicate that effort. There's a cost matrix that hasn't been um, established yet, but essentially what that will say is that all of you will charge the same things for the same services. And we're looking for like what would be the cost of a portfolio, do we do that by credit, um, which we most likely will do, um, what would be the cost of um, a challenge exam or, um, you know, transcripting credit, that kind of thing, where the cost, and it's only cost of assessment, not cost of credit. And we're looking at transfer advisement, and this is one that I think is very impactful for you. Until we know whether the Department of Higher Education is going to create a policy that allows open transfer of prior learning assessment credit to four-year institutions, we're going to have to continue to do what we've been doing, which is let students know that it might or might not transfer into the receiving institution. But at the same time, what I'm wanting um, to shout is that we are building a system that's really trustworthy. And what we need to do is to approach our four-year partners and say, we've changed practices to the extent that we're very confident that the students coming out have the credential that we say they do, that they have the ability and the skill, and we'll see what we can do about not having them to be excessively evaluated for that credit just because it's ELA credit. So there's going to be, um, you know, you'll have to at the local level be thinking how you want to deal with that for students or in the students' best interest. So the PLA are the same, essentially standardized tests, challenge exams, portfolios, and published guides. 
With a few things to this, um, we expanded the standardized tests in the matrix to include more tests. So um, CDH is in the process of creating a statewide standardized test matrix that they tell us we'll have in the spring and trump the matrix, but I think it will be pretty reflective of what we have. Um, it still requires that they have a credential to support whatever it is that they brought in. Um, challenge exams are developed by fa faculty. What we've done with those is we've added a list into the matrix that says which colleges offer challenge exams for which courses. So students and advisors can look at those and say, okay, well, we don't offer a, um, we don't challenge, you know, welding, but CCD does. So if you want to go there and, and touch base with their department, then they'll work with you on a, a challenge test. And give a student doesn't have to register for any other classes, doesn't have to attend the institution. They can go to the college that offers the exam if that's necessary, and they can take it there and get it on their transcript. Um, portfolio, we're, we're working a lot on um, how we're going to build up faculty training for portfolio assessors, um, actually for any kind of course assessment to really tighten up the way that we do that and the standards that we use um, to more common across colleges. And then in published guides, the one thing that we added, we have the ACE credit, we have military and workforce um, credit, but we've also added um, under there an opportunity for um, locally evaluated um, credit for industry workplace. So, for instance, if you're in, um, you know, phones and Whitmix wants you to come in and bring faculty in to do an evaluation of their employee training for it, that's something that would be available for you to do. You script that credit, you make that evaluation, your faculty team signs off on it, and we get it into the matrix, and then it would be able to be available to the students at any of the institutions. And M can do that. Um, the bottom line on all of this is that the evaluations and the decisions about equivalencies are made by faculty. So that's a tiny little nutshell of what's going on with all this. And I think if you guys are like the rest of the groups that I've been talking with, you probably have questions already that may or may not have been answered from the work that we did on um, Monday and Tuesday with the introduction. Um, but what I'd like to do is this, and it worked well the last time I tried it, so we'll try it again. What I ask you to do is to write your questions in the chat box, and um, what I will do is um, take them as they come in, and we'll um, look to the person who has asked the question. I'll mute them, um, and I will ask them to read the question, and I will either respond to it myself or just myself, or I might ask for help from um, other experts who are in the room, um, and pretty much, you know, I, I don't have all the answers to all the questions. And one of the things that I had hoped for these sessions is that we would get um, questions that we haven't seen before so that we make sure that we're really hitting on all of the points that are important to you. Um, you're doing the job on the ground, and we can make guesses about things, but there's lots of things that we'll miss because we're not doing the job on the ground. So I'm um, hopeful that you have questions and that you have questions to share. I know it takes a little bit for them to pop up on the screen, but um, if you would go ahead and just type and um, send to all participants, um, and I will start as soon as I start seeing the first one. We'll start working on, but you can continue to to enter them as uh, as often as you want, and we'll start dealing with them. We have I I purposely set aside the vast majority of the time today to be able to talk and answer questions and, and um, bring up points. Um, in the Red Rise group, there was a lot of conversation about how. Uh, things like the one one new piece of this um, of the policy um, that the restaurants were concerned about is that um, PLA credit can now be uh, now required to be openly transferred between CCCS institutions. So it used to be that college could say, well, we that kind of course from this college, but we won't take it from that college, and that's no longer the case. That if a college transcripts PLA credit, that it has to be accepted at all the other colleges. Um, and there were some questions about that, especially things like. Um, one of the things that came up was standardized tests and effective dates. What if um, we've we've um, left the decision making around effective dates for some tests in the institutional level? And what if institutions have a disagreement and one thinks one thing and one thinks another? So we're going to continue to have that conversation and see if we can come to some kind of a compromise that works um, as far as that's concerned. So those types of things came up and we talked about them. Any questions? I hope you're not feeling shy. Hi. Um, this is your time. I, I can imagine that you don't have any questions. I'm going to ask you to really wrap up here for me. Um, 
If you have questions, just open the chat box at the top of your screen. You click chat, it'll pop up right where it says send to. You draw down all participants and then enter a question in there. I'm sorry, I understand your question. Just saying that we were just talking about that at the registrar's group um, about expiration dates. Um, essentially, what we talked about was whether um, we need to have um, the, what they, we call them as ex effective dates um, for standardized testing. And the, the crux of that conversation is that sometimes yes and sometimes no. And we need to have more conversation, which we will have with the registrars, about um, they feel that ought to be standardized and we ought to continue to be locally decided. And that's really the big part of the conversation. Do we take some and parts of that and say that they're only going to be, that have, like for instance, the DT Pathways courses that are, you know, that kind of have a long shelf life. So um, English or history or that kind of a course, you know, do we get at the what's kind of additional 10-year framework and then look at something like the technical courses and have them be um, have them have a shorter um, life? So if you're you do computer science, that that computer science test is only good for a, a year or two years or three years, based on faculty decisions, based on a lot of things. So. Um, I'm going to, this, there's a question here from Ross Barnhart, and Ross, I'm going to open you up if I can find you on the list, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to read your question for the group. So you're unmuted, Ross, go ahead. Okay, so I was wondering if that the assessment costs are set system-wide, and if so, it's already set, when would we find out what those charges would be? Great question. They're not set yet. We're working on them. What I've been doing is gathering information about the relative kind of basic costs of doing business, essentially. So um, what I'm acting is, is who does the work, how is it done, how long does it take, and I'm doing some research on other colleges and what they um, are, and what they are um, you know, how they're looking at that. So there's a couple of different ways that that's worked nationally and, and um, locally. All of our colleges do different things right now. Um, and one of the things that we found out is in terms of supporting this activity fiscally, some companies are good at, at setting realistic costs for this um, opportunity in terms of, you know, you're allowed to charge up to 50% of the cost per credit. Um, and some are at the far end of that where that's what they charge for everything, and some are at the other end where they charge little or nothing for anything. Um, we're trying to find a way to standardize that so that, that uh, colleges are actually being able to use the funds that they uh, receive for assessment to support the process of assessment. So one of the, things, one of the questions that we're going to be working through, and this will be a, a partly a committee decision. The committee will be meeting in December, I believe. Um, that we need to decide how um, we want to look at that. So should a portfolio be based on um, Three credits. And should there be additional costs for more credit, or um, some institutions will charge a flat fee for a portfolio, no matter how many credits, um, which I don't think is very realistic because it typically takes a, a person to um, assess a portfolio. You know, different subject matter expert. Um, some institutions, subject matter experts are paid for that. Some are not. So what we're is how do we make sure that that's equitable? Faculty, we're going to ask that they be trained to do it, so they really ought to be um, compensated. So, you know, if, if a faculty member takes three hours to review a portfolio, um, based on what their hourly cost for that would be, what would be a reasonable amount of cost, and does it still fit within that less than 50% parameter? So, those kinds of questions that we need to get answered, and we have not finished that conversation. So, anything that any of you might want to um, add that conversation in any way would be very helpful. Um, there's often the conversation about what a, you know how, how that might burden students. Part of what we're looking at with this is it is um, it is opportunity to credit that is significantly reduced cost. And one of the suggestions that I've made is that if students are coming in who want to do this but who are 
you know, definitely going to um, apply for the college where they're already in the college and we want to try to um, offer the opportunity to current students, which is also something we're asking you to consider doing, then they may want to use some of their financial aid for that. Not that they could directly apply it, but they, you know, if they refund that they might use some of their refund for that. Um, so in part of Ross's question, good good question, when the goal for when the cost to be settled and rolled out, all of this stuff will be in the manual when the manual is completed and we're doing the draft um, uh, we do an open review um, period starting Monday the 16th through the 30th. Um, and, and the intention for that is that either the cost matrix is ready to go when um, we roll on Monday as a draft for um, opinions or we'll meet as a committee and have it finished and have it in the draft before the manual is um, published, which will be at the beginning, no later than the beginning of January have it available to you for the new semester. Um, okay. So, um, Josh, you come on and, and um, share your comments. And you can... Um, I know that there are a lot of one-credit classes. An example is um, for state CPR. I get a lot of portfolios for that. So it doesn't really seem like that should be billed at a three credit hour rate. They usually take me about 10 or 15 minutes to review equity also as well as an advisor. So um, I have a couple five credit hour classes and sometimes can take, you know, and I have to go through a point depending on how detailed this student is. Okay, that's feedback. Thank you. I see the other part of that is that um, we, as we look at what's required of the faculty member, there's there's a separation of the activity. Part of it is the assessment of the portfolio, and one of the places where faculty feel as though it's not equitable is we're also doing the development of the portfolio. And we're um, suggesting as we're working forward in implementation, and what I'm going to be putting out to faculty is that um, colleges, or what we'd like to do is create a one-credit course um, support students in developing a portfolio on their own, and then if they want to have a faculty mentor, that um, that person then could be paid for the from the um, the cost of the tuition for the course. Just a, a big part of this is making sure that people aren't doing a lot of work that they're not getting paid for, which has been the norm. Um, not you know fair to the people who are putting in all of this time. I suspect Jocelyn, you've done an awful lot of these and probably have never been compensated for that extra load. Um, that's a that's very good feedback, thank you. And that's the kind of conversation that we'll have around us to get it set up. Other questions? Um, you, are you seeing anything in all of this that's making you concerned that we're missing something? Are you um, yourself, uh, yeah, this is a great idea, but I'm not going to do it? Um, maybe don't make me do it. Um, I already do it and I don't need all of this stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to know. If there are fears associated with this, or concerns, things that like really pop to you that, you know, we need this thing. Um, you know, I know what it's like to be sitting in your office and to have something, you know, quote unquote come down from the system to do. And that's um, the intent of this particular activity. It's really meant to be an opportunity for students, a big opportunity for students. And in many ways, um, you do it right, in my opinion. To be uh, a way to create efficiency around the work that you're doing um, to allow more opportunity for students without overburdening you. Thank you, Justin. She said it's a great effort to improve our recruiting and service of students. I agree. One of the things that we're finding from the data on this, and um, you know, we have we have data that we gathered for the system that um, we used to get a baseline for our um, evaluation. We're, we're supporting the cost of this through our Champ grant. Um, and one of the things that we figured out is that the students who uh, have prior learning assessment credit on their transcripts of the boards, despite whatever demographic, um, can put a higher rate and also persist at a higher rate. We know that this is a good service for them. So Ross has another question here. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and open you up, Ross, and you can ask that again. Go ahead. 
you know, role in this is fairly small. I'm not an advisor, but so I, I'm wondering what groups of people have been involved and informed along the way. Because I just, I had heard a lot on my campus, and so I'm wondering, I'm hoping others on campus are informed and have been involved along the way. I'm just ignorant. <laughs> No, it's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, so the committee, um, the, the, the beginning of this was the formation of a, a prior learning assessment committee. We call ourselves credit for prior learning committee before we changed the name. Um, the committee was gathered um, partly um, through, uh, well, we started with a request out to the vice presidents for um, kind of nominees people that they felt would be um, good to be on the committee to be working on the policy and procedures. And the other part of it is, is that we wanted to be able to support their activities. So we recruited primarily from the, the colleges that were associated with the CHAMP grant so that we ensured that those colleges would support the travel and, and um, the cost of people coming to Denver once a month and that kind of thing. So what we ended up with is, um, what we ended up with is, uh, um, not every college was represented, but every element of all of the colleges was represented. So we had advisors, we had testing center people, we had registrars, we had um, uh, we had vice president, we had deans, we had faculty, um, script evaluators, I believe. Um, so we had a pretty wide range of people. Um, it was heavily weighted on the side of registrars, and I think that's right because really the, the nuts and bolts of the work that we do with this is born and raised in the registrar's office. The only part of the entire system that was standardized um, prior to the work that we started doing was the registrar's work. So the way that the coding was um, created and, and um, run through was a lot of the registrar's office, so that was appropriate. We're doing more. Um, now with pulling in faculty, uh, registrar's group, um, the statewide registrar's group was involved over the summer with um, Jill Johnson who pushed all that out to them. I have now um, started working more with faculty as far as the state faculty um, advisory council. I went to that and talked with them a little bit about what we're doing. And then we also have training. Um, you know, this afternoon we'll have the faculty conversation, but we've also had a faculty assessor training that's going to be held next year, um, the beginning of the, of the spring, for um, faculty members to learn how to um, us, and then also for us to build um, an assessment system that's more standardized than what we've had in the past. It's going to hit you with a bunch of requirements, but we're asking that um, faculty follow some principles around assessment and that they become more standardized across colleges so students have more opportunities for equity, that a, a, an instructor's opinion is someone based on something other than their learning um, outcomes or their learning demonstrations to overly um, influence their decision around grades. Um, you know, and that's been something that has been problematic at some places where it's for someone who, who well, I always use the example of an auto instructor I used to have who didn't like the way some young men dressed and, and um, his opinion of them was very low because of the way they dressed. It didn't have a lot to do with who they were. And I thought someone like him being able to assess skill and how much that opinion of the way that that student dressed would have something to do with his grade. So things like that, that we want to make sure that we're creating a system that allows for equity and it allows students to um, be able to get the best advantage of this. Other questions? I'm sorry, I'm not seeing more questions. I don't know if it's because you're just really happy. Okay. Um, Thomas suggested that we talk about ACE, ACP, how that fits in with this. Um, for you who um, are not familiar with that, the um, ACE, ACP project is something that we were, uh, were involved in as part of a grant. The um, system signed on to it last year, and what it is doing is in, for, if you're not only with ACE, the American Council on Education, they are the, the body in the nation that um, uh, looks at non-accredited learning opportunities, classes, training, all kinds of things in both workforce and in the military. And they um, have faculty experts who look at those things and make determinations about whether learning that's happening could be um, college level. And so college credit recommendations. So what ACE did this, um, 
if uh, what ACE did um, with this is they um, they uh, request for proposals to um, tees in the country that are not accredited. So the kind of there's a lot of things that have popped up over the last couple of years around um, free or no cost education, um, MOOCs, and um, really more formally some of the companies that have come up, so Streetline, EdX, um, Sophia, that offer courses at lower no cost to students and are actually um, way with a strong curriculum and that have assessments attached to them. So offer them an opportunity to submit courses for review. ACE reviewed those courses. They sent the reviewed courses out to those of us who signed on to the project in 111 of them. And then we took those courses to our faculty. We had a convening back in August. And we asked them to look at those courses and to see if they felt any of them were equivalent to CCS courses. And 40 of them that they felt were equivalent. And what we've done then is put them into the matrix as crosswalks. So the difference there is, first of all, that they're pre evaluated so that when somebody comes in with a transcript, an ACE transcript that shows that they took a straighter line course that already assessed, then that's going to be an automatic, yep, you get credit for that kind of a transfer opportunity. You don't have to go get faculty to assess it again. Um, and we're trying to do more and more of that where we're reducing the amount of, of assessment that goes on for the same credentials. Um, and so that piece is now in place. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open you up here in a second, Rosalie, and let you ask that question. Let me find you. You're not listed alphabetically. You're listed by when you came on. And really, I don't have you on audio, so I can't open you up. I apologize. The question that she asked is, she says, the HIT program at ACC is HMA. We are hoping that many of our students can use PLA for credit. With CCCS support programs that have to maintain accreditation if we need to validate or verify to our accrediting agencies that PLA is fair, equivalent, equivalent. I think the first thing that you want to do when there's any accrediting agency involved, and um, a larger side, HLC um, strongly endorsed um, the use of what they call third-party assessments, and that includes ACE. Um, and so that piece of that is um, very strong. And then they also endorse local um, faculty evaluation prior assessments that are based on the accredited curriculum. So what we're doing is um, strong supported. They came out with a position paper on it by um, HLC, which is our um, accrediting body. And with the others, like nursing, like the health sciences, um, you want to check with them first and find out if they have taken any kind of a position on prior assessment. Some of them have said they won't accept it at all, and you want to make sure that that's not going to be an issue. If they say that they will accept it based on certain practices or principles, what we want to do is have the conversation and make sure that the faculty in your area know that they're going to be held accountable to those practices and principles. So whether they can do it within the PLA system is not a question. Sure, they can do it. But what we want to make sure is that the accrediting bodies are fine with the way that they're doing it. So that would be, I think that it would be a good thing to do some research um, your accrediting body to see how they would want to be looking at that. And I suspect that they'll use the same standards that we're all using, which are um, from Yale, from the Council on Adult and Experiential Learning. That's become a national standard. And what we're using in terms of training and um, holding our assessors accountable, um, that would be part of it. And then also, then we would want to make sure that your people, your faculty who would be assessors are adequately trained and they would underscore that and say that they trained in, in um, this kind of assessment. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Jocelyn has another question, and I'm going to pull you up, Jocelyn, so that you can talk. I know that I have you on audio. So go ahead with your question. Well, a comment about um, accreditation. The, uh, the Occupational Student Health Program, which is the one in here for at Canada State, that I did by ABET. And in the last couple of times that we've had site visits and um, revisit the program, there are major concerns and questions. And um, we do mostly portfolio credit, where we had a formal process in place um, in prior and awarding credit. And all of that, we were sure to do 
let students know that the credit might not transfer when they went on for a year program. That's all. And I think that that's probably pretty pretty safe for a lot of them. So like I think the most important thing is making sure that, that whatever accrediting body you're having to answer to is giving some solid information about what their expectations are. And then, you know, there's a lot of things that you can design for yourself locally on prior learning assessment. We try to, to hit a balance of here are the standards that help us to do the job and to be more efficient, ensure that we're equitable, and then here are the things that you can do at your um, campus that are more geared toward your body, the type of goals that you're trying to reach, so, um, that there's enough facility in that, um, the, the, in the procedures that allow you to do that. What other questions? The whole the whole um, issue of a four year transfer is one that I know has come up a number of times. And, and the thing about that to me is, is that you know we don't have a lot of control over what the four year institutions do. And I have some hope for what um, is being done at CDHE in terms of, of um, standardizing a policy across the state. But I don't know how long that's going to take. How it pan out when it all kind of is finished. It's like it's like primaries in the election. I try not to get too involved because <clears throat> I really want to focus on what's going to happen in the end of it all. But um, well, that part of what's in the proposed policy says that, <clears throat> excuse me, institution of higher education, including two and four-year institutions, that transcripts credit for prior learning assessment can that transferred that credit will transfer the same as any other uh, without further evaluation. So our credit, a credit is a credit. It would be accepted. I'm um, optimistic about something like that, but I know that when I say that, people kind of smile at me because I don't think other people think it's possible. But I'm hopeful in the interest of best serving students that we can stop assessing them every time they walk through the four-year door. I think the most important thing in advising students is to make sure that, that you have a, a sense that they're going to be transferring. If they have a sense of what a receiving institution might be, that they spend some time talking to that receiving institution in their major to make sure that the um, credit transcripting are going to help them. The best issue for them over time is going to be that if they're transcripting credit that's not going to transfer and they have to take it again, that there's financial aid implications for them. If they get over their 150, if they, um, you know, if, they, if they've accessibly, it, it, this is if they changed a major, you know, if they, they accessibly transcribe credit and then they've, they've kind of shot themselves in the foot. I think it's important for us to know, um, you know building those connections. I'm hopeful, and I was, I'm, I'm asking this from most of our um, partners, is to say that if we really feel confident in the assessment of credit, if we feel confident in our credit crosswalks and we do what we need to to feel confident, they ought to be more transparent and reach out in a stronger way to our four-year partners to say, we have a system in place. We have we have new standards in place. We feel very confident that the students have the skills that we're um, crediting. We want, can we create articulation that says you'll accept that, or can we create an articulation agreement that says that, that um, you know we've agreed that this is an equivalency and that the students credit will go ahead and transfer. It may not be that we get a, a blanket statement that says yes, we'll take it, but perhaps your own four-year partners can be. Um, you know, you can get them at the table and talk to them about how that might work for you. It's not that hard a conversation in the career and technical education areas. They have a tendency to be more concrete about, yeah, those skills transfer. Um, might be something that you want to investigate with some of the other institutions to see. Um, the standardized test scores and, um, that are going to be standard across the state will help that process. Most of the students that we see who get stopped to transfer are stopped because of standardized test scores because they've been so varied across the system, across the state, and um, theoretically that's going to help. Um, I'm sure in practice the way that they're currently playing with it, if it's going to be helpful or as helpful as we had hoped, but theoretically that says that we'll know what everyone's standard is. We meet that standard and it doesn't have to be second guessed. So the score is the same for the same course crosswalk. We transcript it that way, and it just goes through. There's no stopping it and questioning it because we're all working under the same standard. Um, and we'll see how that's going to work out. What else? We have a few more minutes. We have actually 15 more minutes if we have more questions. Jocelyn, again, thank you. Um, 
think of signing and formalizing in a good way, um, what you've already been doing with students, that's awesome. Is the way a lot of you so Christine has asked a question. That's a really good question. I'm going to open you up here in just a second and let you um, let's go ahead, Christine. Karen, is the pushback from faculty and chairs regarding the portfolios and test out? Um, I'm even chairs said to me, "Don't you know, let's let's say anything. Uh, let that be our last option." Typing so does make me a little anxious and nervous bringing this up in the basic thing. Good, good point, really good point. Um, um, you know, interesting. Um, I thought some of what we're all experiencing, we're all going to experience, is kind of unfounded fear, but I don't for a minute. Um, discount that fear because it can be very powerful in terms of stopping our processes. I think that um, part of what I would do, and it, you know, and I also understand the power dynamic, the difference you know, between advising and faculty. It's always it's always interesting to see how well we can um, we can crosswalk from student services to the instructional side. But I think an important conversation to get on the table rather than just a side conversation to get your directors involved to. Um, your vice presidents involved, your deans to say, not really, it's not, you know, it's more, rather than saying, okay, we think that this, we, you know, okay, yeah, that's great, but don't tell anybody we don't want it to start going on here. I think it's really important to challenge that, that conversation and to say, why? Why would we not want that to happen? And if, if, the, if my experience of it is that it's grounded in fear, that the fear has to do with um, what you hear from people is that, um, it, um, we've got the time, nobody's got the resources, and, um, you know, we're going to be inundated. And then there's this um, underlying insecurity about, about priority assessment equals not rigorous, not equal, or it's, a, you know, people are buying credits. And what I'm trying to do and I'm going to continue to do as long as I have this position is to really challenge those assumptions. I think, um, like for a particular faculty member or for the chair, I would say, I ask, you know, let's can we have a conversation about this and really find out what the fear is. Why would we not want to do that? Um, if they not created challenge exams and there are challenge exams created at other institutions, we want to get in touch with them and ask if they would want to share them, which I have found is usually the case. Sure, I send, I'll send you that math weight test or whatever. Um, is it because they don't have, the faculty don't have time to develop those things? I think the fact that colleges are willing to share, or you can send a student to another place. Um, things like um, the time that it takes to review portfolios. Some people are more willing than others, so it's worth saying well, who among the faculty would be interested in having a little bit of an extra income if they're, if they're a subject matter expert who wants to review a portfolio. Or, um, you know, we're working on developing rubrics, for instance, that help to focus the work in terms of a portfolio evaluation. And the way that that focus helps is that you're not all over the map saying, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to be looking at. There's a process that you go through. Um, some of the institutions that we're working with right now through the CHAMP grant, um, and then we're going to expand this out, they're creating portfolio templates. So a template would be similar to a challenge test, but what it would be is like a, a fill-in from kind of a thing or guidance for the student that says, if you challenge, you know, machining, you know, the first level of a machining course, here are the things that you're expected to do. Here are the demonstrations you're expected to show the documents that you might have to provide so that that exists so that if a student says, hey, I want to do that thing, you can hand it over to them. And then the time that the faculty member puts in will be more minimal um, or start to develop expertise amongst the departments to say, is there someone who wants to take on, you know, being a one credit independent study that is about portfolio development and then they want to take that on as one of their courses and they can then be um, reimbursed for the cost. So. I guess the, the very long answer to, to the short question to me is the, the shorter part of it is to say I would challenge that. I wouldn't let that just be the way it is. Um, I'd really get that. Your leadership is coming on really strongly in favor of this. I think the other part of it is that I would look at the people who are your champions. Um, your recruiters are probably going to really like this um, you know, in terms of um, 
the ways that we can start to underscore how much how positively this affects completion and persistence. We can start looking at instruction and say, you know, the time it takes or the effort that it takes to let somebody use that portfolio is paid back to you and the credits that that student will earn when they become a student and stay and complete because we can say, you know, data shows us that these people come in and they, and they complete at, uh, what, two thirds higher rate than students with OPLA, like ridiculously high numbers uh, in terms of their opportunities for completion. So uh, I think part of maybe what part of what I can help is to kind of round up the rhetoric a little bit more. Um, well, we have very little of this portfolio challenge exams because it has been such a gray area for us, and that's great. And you know, one of the things that I want to say to all of you is that um, I might, you know, Pam and Thomas and, you know, other members of our team are available to help you with this on your campuses. I purposely did this particular rollout in this way because I felt like we'd be able to reach more people and that we could do it, um, we could record these and have it be an asynchronous kind of an activity so that um, you all be able to, um, um, to take advantage of this um, in an asynchronous time frame. And I you know, the part of that is that it, it, I put it out to your leadership to say that if you wanted me or, or others to come on your campus to talk about this and to help you to build these systems, we absolutely will. Because that's the thing about implementation, that, it, that it, you know, each of you has a, has some form of a unique set of requires um, that requires you to, to be able to, um, in a way that's best serving your students. Uh, I'm going to encourage you to send me email if you have questions or to call if you'd like. Um, you think you'd like me to come to your campus, you can talk to your um, leaders, let me know what you want me to do. Um, we have these conversations in person and kind of press out all of the information and see how we might start building some systems that help you. Um, 